Well, we're continuing our message series through what we've called Vision Month. And I've already mentioned in the service that just a couple of weeks ago we had Vision Sunday and we started to clarify not new vision, but actually just refining of a vision, a journey we've been traveling along for for a number of years now as an extension of uh, a, a mission, a purpose for existing that this church has had for many, many years. And so I'm going to pick this up and uh, continue along in just explaining today, hopefully exploring uh, a little bit about what that looks like for us in community and what we value, what we prize by way of just refining uh, those uh, details um, that we've been doing as part of our strategic planning process amongst the church leadership uh, in recent months. You might remember this picture if you've been journeying with us. This, for me, is a bit of an image that is more and more speaking to me as the year unfolds. I, I didn't expect that this would be the case, but as I sit there, I, I feel, and apologies to Bodies who are picking out all kinds of interesting bits of information that are genuinely interesting in here, but in the simplest of concepts, that this is what life, outside of a relationship with Jesus, I think is actually like. Like, here are these boats and they're dry, so they're not actually getting to do what they were built and made to do. Like, they're on dry ground, but boats aren't built for dry ground, are they? And so the boats are there, they exist, but they're certainly not experiencing the life they were made for or they were intended for. And I think that's really sad. I feel sad for these boats. This isn't right. Someone should do something about this. And the beauty is, is we know the one who has done something about this. So our reason for existing here at Real Life Christian Church is to be drawing people into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus because we believe that's how someone actually experiences the life that God intended for all humanity, for every human being. And it's only experienced in that relationship with Jesus. And a couple of weeks ago, I used this scripture to paint that picture. I want to remind you of it. Colossians 3, 1 to 4 from the New Living Translation. The ancient church leader Paul writes, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at God's right hand in the place of honor and power. Let heaven fill your thoughts do not think only about things down here on earth, for you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your real life, is revealed to the whole world, you'll share in all his glory. The real life we were made for is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is why the outworking of our mission together, of drawing people into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus, is more people knowing real life in Jesus. Unapologetically. This is what we hope to see. This is what we hope to be becoming, to be more people knowing real life in Jesus. I'm excited by this. This is what I want to give my energy to. Since I gave my life to Jesus as an 18, 19 year old, this is kind of occupied behind all the things that I'm doing, my time in the business world, my time in sporting clubs. Behind all of that was this desire that more people would know the real life that I was discovering and growing in, in Jesus. I hope that might capture your hearts too more and more. And for that reason, if, if this is true, then we as a church have determined that we will be fervently Christ-focused and spirit-led. If he is where real life is, then that's where we orient ourselves. And if he has life for us to know, which comes in the empowering of the Holy Spirit, then we want to be led by that spirit who reveals to us more and more the person of Jesus. And last week, if you've been journeying with us through Vision Month, we had a fantastic message on how you know, part of the overflow of being fervently Christ-focused and spirit-led is going to lead us to be immersed in prayer. That we're going to enter into that dialogue. We're going to access the resources of heaven. We're going to not see prayer as a burdensome life preserver, but we're going to hang on to it for all it's worth. This is the overflow of what real life does and sparks in us. It orients us towards 
the person of Jesus and relationship with him. And as a church, we want to take that really, really seriously. And so we take the words of Jesus seriously. And in one of the accounts of Jesus' life recorded by Mark, in chapter 12, Jesus responds to a question of what what are the most important commandments that God might have for us to live out? And he summarizes it like this. He says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second commandment is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. This is what Jesus says. Like, if, if you're going to get about this real life, then in summary, it's like this. Connect. Connect deeply with God and connect deeply with others with an orientation of love and servanthood. And so this is an emphasis for us in 2021. Real Life Christian Church, those online, those here on site, we want to be connecting deeply with God. We need to make space for that. Last year made lots of us less busy than we would normally have been. For some of us, it made us way more busy. But for many of us, it's given an opportunity to consider the rhythms of our life. And my counsel to you would be very careful about picking up everything you had to drop. To make space to do more deep connecting with God and more deep connecting with with others. Because when we do this, we walk out what Jesus summarizes as the greatest commandments that we have. To love the Lord your God with everything you are and to love others. Let's do that. Let's do that well. But as I said, we take the words of Jesus very seriously. So in another account of his life and ministry in John, we read these words of Jesus. In John 13, he says, a new command I give you, love one another As I have loved you, so you must love one another. There's some weight to that. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So he says that we are to love one another as he has loved us. So let's think about that. How has he loved us? Let's go back to this image of boats on dry ground. And instead of seeing others, let's look at this and go, actually, for those of us who are Christ followers, at some point before that, this was us. We were those boats. We were those boats. We might not have even known it. We were happy as a boat, but something felt dry. We realized that maybe there was more to life than this that maybe we weren't quite experiencing, we we didn't know necessarily, and then the wonderful truth of who Jesus is broke into our life and we made a decision to allow the ocean of his love, the ocean that enables us to be all that God intended us to be, to come in. Now think about this. Do any of these boats have any control over when and how the tide comes in? No, they don't. They don't have any say. These boats here, they don't get to determine when the tide comes in. They don't get to determine if it comes in. Those things are set in place by things beyond them. There's nothing they can do to float themselves. In this image, in the simplest interpretation of this image. And that is why we want to marvel at this truth that we are told and have explained to us by this amazing leader, Paul, in the first century, recorded in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, it's because of his, that's God, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. Let me pause there. Even when we were high and dry in life, doing it on our own, he goes on, It is by grace that you've been saved. You and I can't make the tide come in on God's grace and love for us. He took all the initiative. Isn't that good news? You don't have to be good enough. Because when I look in the mirror, I realize I'm not. 
It is by grace that you've been saved. We'll continue from verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is amazing. This is so amazing. It goes on to say, For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith, And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In layman's terms, it's God that brings the tide in on your life, not you. But he does bring the tide in. He has brought the tide in. He's made it possible for us to live the life we were intended to live in relationship with him. And it's a beautiful thing. And every Easter, we take special moments to celebrate all that transpired so that we might actually be a boat on the ocean and not just in dry dock in the mud of our sin and our transgressions. It's by grace. Can I put this to you? We are grace bearers. We are grace bearers. If we have discovered real life in Jesus Christ, we are grace bearers. It's a bit like this. If you're going, okay, that's nice. You might be sitting here. You might be online. You're going, Adam, I know this. I still marvel at this truth. But I don't know that we always fully understand it. It's a bit like this husband and wife who are in a hospital. And unfortunately, This poor wife, she'd had a horrible accident at work that had deeply injured her face. And the doctor had had to do some pretty radical plastic surgery, but the challenge was really hard. It was such a sad event. She was disfigured. And as they sat in the hospital room, his wife bandaged up and all he could see was his eyes. The husband waited there for the doctor to slowly unwrap the dressings. They'd see the result of the work that had gone on. And slowly the bandages wound their way off. And eventually, this man's wife's face was completely laid bare for the doctor and for him to see. Now the doctor had done the best he could. But what had been left was a slight but very noticeable disfigurement of her mouth. It no longer sat the way it should. It was a a, a little bit askew. But the doctor was struck when the husband leaned over and took her face and leaned over and adjusted his own mouth to be able to line up with her disfigured one and kissed her hungrily. That is what God did when he sent Jesus into our mess in this world. Is he adjusted his self to come into our mess, to be incarnated as a human being so that he might hungrily kiss us with the kiss of grace to reveal his love to us. We're grace bearers. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been kissed despite the fact that you weren't all quite put together nicely. (coughs) Excuse me. He hungrily leaned in. And made the adjustment in grace for us to have intimate relationship with him. Now for those of you who are married, I invite you to go home and practice. (laughs) Be reminded of the kiss of grace. We're grace bearers. And if we are the recipients of such a wonderful gesture... And how can we be anything but then grace sharers? If we know that we can't float our own boat, it's not anything we've did, uh, done, we're not good enough, then uh, we've received this incredible gift. We've been recipients of the, the hungry, intimate kiss of grace, that we are grace bearers. How could we but do anything but pass that on to others? To share that grace with others. To share that love. To share that capacity to go, I'm foregoing making you be perfect in order to deal with me. I'm going to extend the grace that I've received. As we heard before, 
Jesus had these words for us in John 13. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another with this same grace that enables us to be loved by God that we might in fact pass it on to others. And when we do that, others notice. That's countercultural in our world. It gives hope. It shines a light. Now, this is an interesting thing for us because even though we might receive the grace of God, we're a work in progress, aren't we? You know, you could just, I'm not going to ask you to turn to the person next to you in the room online or here in the room and say, you're a work in progress because like, let's be honest, you already know. And so uh, here's the reality. We are a work in progress. So God is working on us as we go. And this is a helpful thing. Because what can happen to us as Christians is the longer we are immersed in this grace, we can stop wading deeper and stop passing it on. And this interesting thing called entitlement creeps into our mindset sometimes. And we can forget how we are all recipients of this kiss of grace. Jesus told this parable in Matthew 20 of these vineyard workers Now, they were just men who were in the marketplace, and the vineyard owner went out into the marketplace to find workers to go into his vineyard. And he went out early in the day, and he recruited a few uh, people to come and work in the vineyard, and he promised to pay them a certain amount. And as the day went on, he realized he needed more workers, and so he went out into the vineyard, and he, uh, sorry, went out into the marketplace, and he found more workers to come in and promised to pay them a certain amount. And then yet again, even later in the day, needing still more workers, he goes out and finds some people. He says, come and work. I'm going to pay you this much to work in my vineyard. And they only work a couple of hours towards the end of the day. And at the end of the day, he gets his foreman to gather them all together and to pay them what they were owed for the day. And sure enough, starting with the ones who uh, arrive later, they get what they were promised. They get a a denarius. They get this coin. It's not a, uh, you know, it's It's a day's pay, like it's a generous day's pay. But they didn't work a full day, and then he works his way down, and the ones who were there for half a day, they get paid. They get paid the same amount. And he goes to the ones who were there at the start, and he pays them, and they get paid the same amount. And then we read these words in Matthew 20, 13 to 16. He says, but he answered one of them who complained. Let me pause there for a moment. The workers who got paid the same, who'd worked the longest day, they complained. And all of us Australians are going, and so they should. What kind of enterprise bargaining agreement is that? That's terrible. Don't they know I deserve more for what I've done? Don't they know they should consider me more for this? It's a reasonable thing they're doing if we look at this story that Jesus is telling through purely economic eyes. But let's read on. Jesus answered one of them, Am I not being uh, unfair to you, friend? Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? They'd all agreed to the rate of pay. Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Think about those of us as grace bearers when it comes to grace sharing. That we're not going, well, I've had the grace of God longer, so that entitles me to more grace. Look after me and my stuff, my preferences, what I want. God, that's what you're supposed to do. I've earned it. Can you hear how offensive that must be to the one who is the only one who can bring the tide in to float the boat of your life? He says, are you upset because I'm generous? Because I care about the next person to receive grace as much as I care about you? Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he says this about that story. Jesus' story makes no economic sense, and that was his intent. He was giving us a parable about grace, which cannot be calculated like a day's wages. Grace is not about finishing last or first. It's about not counting. We're not counting whether someone's, you know, kind of working up enough uh, capacity to be worthy of the same amount of grace we are. We're just not counting. We're grace recipients and we're sharing that with others. Isn't that good news? The great news is this. It's not about you. 
That's so freeing. Philip Yancey also says this, All of us in the church need grace-healed eyes to see the potential in others for the same grace that God has so lavishly bestowed on us. That we would look at people in their journey, in their brokenness, and go, but by the grace of God, go, oh, I'm going to love this person. I'm going to do what I can. Yes, they might be coming last, but I'm going to make sure they feel like as if they were first. And that should inform the way we go about our mission. We're grace bearers. We're grace sharers. But a reasonable question to ask in this then is, oh, okay, what does that mean? What about grace and truth, Adam? What about that? Does that mean just anything goes? And, and uh, uh, people can behave in all kinds of ways and selfish and broken ways and, and that's fine and they can just believe whatever they want. And, and uh, what does that mean? Like how do we hold together this amazing tension? And the truth is, is that we do hold this tension. We're not abandoning truth, uh, truth because we're grace bearers and grace sharers. It's just that in our connection with other people, we will come to them with both grace and the truth that Jesus Christ is. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We'll come with grace and truth and in that order. Because as they realize that the tide of God's presence, love, and grace can actually equip them to live out the real life that he made them for, they will discover the wonder of his truth and how secure it is for life sailing with him. Jesus told this, uh, sorry, Jesus had this experience with a woman caught in adultery. She was dragged before him. And the legalistic truth tellers were saying she should die for her brokenness. She should die. No one should be floating her into her potential. She should die. That's what the law says. That's what the truth tells us to do. Jesus says to all of those who would throw stones at her to kill her, well, if you are free from sin, you feel free to cast the first stone. So Jesus is not abandoning the truth. He looks at this woman afterwards after they slowly drop their stones and walk away. And he's not saying, it's all okay what you've done. What he's saying is, I'm not here to condemn you, but don't keep doing this. He comes with grace and then with the truth. Don't keep behaving like this. It's not good for you. It's not good for anyone. Step into the real life that God has for you. And off she goes. I imagine deeply impacted by the grace that was shared. This is the opportunity we have to be grace and truth fairers, that we ride the tension between being grace sharers and holding to the truth, that we ride this beautiful, wild, grace-filled ride of going, we're going to do both. We're going to live out who God calls us to be. We're going to do our best to, to seek out his word and his direction for us, but we are going to do that only by his grace, and we're going to extend that to others, which is why as a church, when we look about our culture and why we express the way we do, why, for example, do our church services work the way they do? Why do we do some of the things we do with hospitality? Why are we shaping some of the stuff that we do in our uh, ministries, in our connecting opportunities? It's important that we acknowledge that we are, it's an interesting word, uh, and I don't want to load it too much, that we would say we are evangelical, that we're gospel and Christ-centered and we're conservative theologically. There's a reason why we express that, because the truth's important. And we don't want to depart from the truth. It's why that we're contemporary in expression because those of us who were first to experience grace are making space for those coming after us to also experience the grace. So we want to make sure that we do it in a way that connects with them. But that's a gracious thing to do. We're not departing from the truth. We're just expanding our expression of grace. And that we are charismatic. We're open and expecting the Holy Spirit to move. Because we want to, people to experience God's grace and it's only as the Holy Spirit encourages and convicts that that's possible. This is why, if you're wondering, why, why are we the way we are? This is why. We're grace bearers, we're grace sharers and we're grace and truth fairers. We ride the in-between. So friends, we're letting you know that as a church, we want to be experienced this way. We want to be fervently Christ-focused and spirit-led. We want to be immersed in prayer. We want to be grace-filled which means we will be good at managing differences between generations. We will be generous in letting go of preferences. We will make sure that the last know that they are first 
and we will be very content with the pay we get, the bottomless grace of God. Remember, real life is a culture we live out, not just a place we attend. My hope, my encouragement, my prayer for me and for you is that when we go out from our gatherings during the week and on a weekend on a Sunday, that as we go out, that we live this out. We live this out. That we partner with God to be a part of the tide that lifts the boats of those who are yet to know a life-transforming relationship with Jesus. Because real life in Jesus is a grace-filled life. Real life in Jesus is a grace-filled life. It's good news, isn't it? It is so good to know. My friends, remember, if we can walk out a grace-filled life, receive it as bearers, and then share it with others, do well to balance the line we carry between the truth that we know and the grace we need to be able to pursue the truth, in our lives, if we can do that well in our lives and do that well together as community, then we'll be a part of a rising tide. And you might recall that a rising tide lifts all boats. That as a community, when we live this out, it will have an impact on the communities around us. That people would go, wow, these people love God. And I can see that God loves me by the way they relate with one another and with me. And they'll accept me as I am. And they will, as they are grace bearers, journey together with me that we might together discover what life on the ocean that God has for us is supposed to be like. Would you like to be a part of a culture like that? It was not a rhetorical question. Would you like to be a part of a culture like that? Because, my friends, we will all need to die a little more to ourselves. But it's so much fun. It's so worth it. Why don't we pause to pray? Lord, we want to thank you for your grace. Lord, first and foremost, that we here can know that is by grace that we're saved. And Lord, I would just ask before we go any further that you would just bring a joyful reminder to our hearts at just how lavish that grace is and of the love that motivated it. That despite our shortcomings, despite our sin, despite our brokenness, that you love us and you've made it possible for us to know you because you died in our place, Lord Jesus. You paid for our sin and then you conquered death to make life forevermore with you. And then, Holy Spirit, you came to lead us in this life and empower us in it. Lord, we sit here at home or in this room and we just choose to receive afresh a revelation of the grace you've lavished on us. Thank you, Lord. I just invite you in this attitude of prayer, maybe just to say thank you. Thank God for his grace to you. Grace that sustains you. And Lord, with gratitude in our hearts, we would now pray that you would help us to be grace sharers. Lord, grace sharers with others in our church community and grace sharers with those beyond our church community. And it might be that you need to lead us to forgiveness for people that have grieved us. We, we haven't extended grace. We've acted with entitlement or we've, we, we've, we've acted with a sense of... of uh, of not recognizing even our own brokenness in the context of relationship. And I pray now by your spirit that the grace might overflow. And as we seek to be grace sharers, that right now you might lead, for anyone who needs it, lead us to a place of forgiveness.
thank you, Lord, for the great freedom that comes in forgiving someone else because we know that it's grace we've received and we're extending grace. It doesn't make um, uh, sinful behavior okay, but it just means we're not going to make them pay for it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us what we need to walk the line between grace and truth, that our culture here might be more and more grace-filled, that we might take it out into our world, that people might experience just the amazing grace that it is. It's such a lavish grace. It's deep. It's bottomless. It's like an ocean. And when we, when we ride the waves of it, it's like the joyful celebration of this is where we were meant to be. May that be our experience and the experience of all others who sail into our midst, Lord God. Holy Spirit, bring a revelation of grace, of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.